there. I believe we're live again. I'm Speed, outside the Helix tonight. And our next presenter, after he verified that New Zealand has never lost to Scotland in cricket. In rugby. 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 Rugby? Rugby. Yeah, but Gordy is a cricket fan. We should look up the cricket scores. <laughs> we don't do so well there. The next clinician worked in broadcast radio, in the airlines, in electronic sales, then at a museum helping people with their military history. So welcome from actually tomorrow in Auckland, New Zealand, Mr. Paul Hobbs. Thank you. Today we're talking about streamlined passenger trains serving St. Louis. We're going to discuss all these topics right here. And I needed to include the gateway arch. Now I could have taken, well, I did take pictures of the arch itself, but it seemed more um, uh, romantic, I guess, to use the shadow of the arch. And the top of the shadow is actually pointing to Market Street, which is the street entrance to um, St. Louis Union Station, a few blocks away from here. Here is the station itself. It's a stub in 32 track terminal and may be the largest station in the United States. I didn't check that particular detail. Uh, all passenger trains who arrive here back into the station. So the smoky end of the train stays uh, closer to the entrance of the train shed. And there's only one railroad that came to St. Louis that operated in both directions. In other words, uh, into St. Louis and then out of St. Louis. And even then they didn't operate for one train through. So um, a lot of sleeping cars were switched from one railroad to another at the station, as we will see further on. And if you really want a modeling exercise, uh, try 47 slip switches. And in 1947, the daily average of trains was 288 per day arriving and departing. That is about one movement every five minutes. The red circle, which you'll see quite a few of highlighting where St. Louis is, is currently highlighting where the station is. I've also mentioned Warbush Delmar Station, which is on Delmar Boulevard. And every train coming from the east, north or west on the Warbush came through Delmar Station. So the ones coming to Union Station from the east would come over the Merchants Bridge, then over the TRRA tracks and down in through Del Mar and come in from the west. Here's the station itself, a rather attractive building. And uh, a couple of pictures below of uh, Missouri Pacific and Wabash locomotives. There's also a a hotel in the station. In fact, even today, there's a hotel in what was uh, St. Louis Union Station. A 1920s postcard. Um, postcards were quite often airplane view, which of course was a novelty in the 1920s. It's a bit fuzzy, but uh, it's essentially the same depot that's right there today. So it's been around a very long time. Two years ago, I gave a talk at Kansas City Convention about passenger trains serving Kansas City, which led to developing this one as well. It's interesting to compare those two stations in that Kansas City was a through station with 16 tracks. St. Louis is a stub end terminal with 32 tracks. In Kansas City, many of the trains passed through, whereas every train that came to St. Louis terminated here. And at Kansas City, no, East Coast Railroad, as in one that touched the East Coast, uh, reached Kansas City, and yet at St. Louis, only less than 300 miles away, no Western Railroad actually came to St. Louis. One dominant railroad in Kansas City with a lot of other railroads, whereas uh, St. Louis was many railroads with moderate amounts of traffic. Kansas City was on the major route to California, St. Louis was not, but it was on the major route to Texas, as we'll see. The Terminal Railroad Association of St. Louis was owned by all of the railroads that came to St. Louis and apparently is the largest freight and passenger terminal operation in the world. 
as you can see down there, there's uh, a large variety of switching locomotives that were operated, mostly EMD, but every other manufacturer was represented with a few locomotives. The TRRA did not operate any passenger trains of its own. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, the SW1 is hauling some Norfolk and Western cars, so that's after 1964. And then below, the earlier paint scheme was grey, hauling a couple of uh, Pennsylvania P70 coaches. 15 major railroads came into St. Louis, and I've listed the successes off to the right, up to and including Conrail. I have not bothered with the split that was after Conrail. Even in the time frame we're talking about, the Southern Railway, as we'll see, didn't have passenger service into St. Louis. Back in 1910, I did some comparisons of the number of railroads serving various cities. Of course, Chicago came out on top with 33, but St. Louis was up there with 22, not far behind New York. So a lot of railroads came to St. Louis. Let's have a look at some of the name trains that came to St. Louis. From the West, we have the city of St. Louis, which was a primarily a UP train, uh, followed by several other trains to Kansas City, Omaha, and the Missouri Pacific to Denver. To the east, all these trains on three railroads went to New York, or Pittsburgh, or Cleveland. And to the north, 10 trains a day at one time operated between St. Louis and Chicago on three railroads. Most of them operated a morning train, a midday train, and a night train. And again, to the north, the Wabash had a couple of trains to Detroit, and the Burlington went to Minneapolis, along with the Rock Island, and the Burlington also had a train that went to Burlington, Illinois, I believe. To the south, the Frisco operated several trains towards Texas and Memphis, and the Missouri Pacific down to Texas. And the L and N, from time to time, ran the Hummingbird to Nashville. Let's have a look at a number of ads which featured passenger trains that served St. Louis. Both the Burlington and the Rock Island featured the Zephyr Rocket, which was a joint train which went between St. Louis and Minneapolis. Uh, here's an early one from the Missouri Pacific featuring the Scenic Limited. The Scenic Limited was the predecessor to the California Zephyr. Union Pacific pushing a train to California. Burlington was showing both Chicago and St. Louis going towards Denver. Baltimore and Ohio had an outpost route that came into St. Louis. Another Baltimore and Ohio ad. Then you have the uh, Louisville and Nashville, which primarily ran from St. Louis to Evansville with connections to mainline trains that went out of there. Union Pacific again with the city of St. Louis, fairly early ad in 1947. And then you've got the all diesel powered Pennsylvania. That's 12 long distance passenger trains operated by the Pennsylvania. Um, starts off with the Broadway Limited, which of course was their flagship train but the spirit of St. Louis is right there behind it. And you've got the Texas Eagle, which uh, they operated with the Missouri Pacific and a couple of other trains that came to St. Louis. Railroads weren't the only people who advertised using trains. So Electromotive was promoting the E units using a Missouri Pacific train. And over on the right, you've got Bud promoting their passenger cars using the Wabash train. More Missouri Pacific ads in the National Geographic, one featuring going to Mexico and another one, the Colorado Eagle, after they'd introduced dome cars. This one in 1957 is an early color ad in the National Geographic. And of course, that's also promoting dome cars, which the Union Pacific at that time called Astrodomes. And uh, another B&O ad for the National Limited. Uh, running around in places like Flickr and Pinterest, I found a few more ads. Uh, this one was rather nice about Missouri Pacific introducing the dieselized eagles. 
Pennsylvania Railroad with the Spirit of St. Louis, and then the Wabash and Union Pacific with the City of St. Louis. This was just starting daily service, which would have been about 1947. That one, there we go. The Burlington said it had through trains to all these places. I'm not sure of the date of that particular ad. And then of course, the Illinois Central, Chicago to St. Louis, two and a half, two and a quarter cents a mile. So relatively inexpensive in its day. Let's move on to some sleeping cars. In 1952, in a book called Night Trains by Peter Macon, it listed all of these places that you get to, that's 50 different cities with terminating uh, sleeping cars out of St. Louis. Now, it wasn't very long before a lot of these dropped off, especially the short haul trips. St. Louis was on the through route for trains going to Texas. It was not on any coast to coast sleeper service, which mostly went through Omaha and Kansas City. So the GMO had a couple of connecting cars that went to Texas on the Missouri Pacific. The Pennsylvania Railroad connected to all these other places, except for the Frisco trip, which we'll talk about when we get to that train. The slumber coach on the B&O, that was a car that was introduced by Bud around 1956. And the B&O and the Missouri Pacific owned a few from 59 to 64. And they used that on the San Antonio route. 64 and 65 is about when the through cars stopped running and uh, all those slumber coaches ended up being bought by the Northern Pacific. This map on the Pennsylvania timetable in 1954 gives a good idea of the way the cars were routed. And here's another of my little circles around St. Louis so that you know where it is fairly quickly. You'll see at St. Louis, they diverge off onto Frisco and Missouri Pacific to different places. At the bottom, there are a couple of models. One on the bottom left is a brass model. And the one on the bottom right is a uh, Walther's model. They are uh, demonstrating that the Pennsylvania Railroad owned cars that were in the color scheme of the connecting railroad. And so you've got Pennsylvania on the headboard or the letterboard of the Frisco car and a very discreet PRR at each end of the uh, Missouri Pacific car, which has got the Eagle name in the middle. And it's one of the rare railroads that put the train name in the letterboard instead of the railroad name. We're going to go through the various railroads who served St. Louis and see what kind of service they provided and how many trains they ran. The biggest was the Wabash with nine trains a day at a particular time. And what I'm doing is using one demonstration timetable somewhere in the late 40s to mid 60s to demonstrate the kind of service they ran. Between Chicago and St. Louis, they ran three trains a day. Each one had a different type of uh, car consist because the day trains didn't need sleepers, and of course the overnight ones did. And uh, they featured dome liner on the Bluebird. Um, that was the feature train of the day. Going across to Kansas City, there were three trains a day, one of which was the uh, city of St. Louis with the Union Pacific, city of Kansas City, which they ran on their own, and then the Midnight Limited, which had sleeping cars. And then to Detroit, there were two trains a day. And again, one carried chair cars and the other carried sleepers. So each one had distinctive look because of the types of equipment it had. If you look at the sleeping cars on the Detroit Limited, one of them is a 12 room at four double bedroom. And the other is a 664. Let me find my glasses. Oh, there they are. The other one is a six bedroom double, uh, buffet lounge. And what I've discovered with these ones with a lot of roomettes is that they tended to be businessmen trains because a lot of sales representatives, etc., would travel on their own. Whereas uh, the ones with double, a lot of double bedrooms 
uh, tended to be more towards family movement. And here we have uh, a train to Omaha and westbound it was called the Omaha Limited and eastbound it was called the St. Louis Limited with one 664 sleeper. Rather pretty locomotive. RH Foss has done a rather nice effort of colorizing black and white photographs and I've stolen a couple of examples off the web. Down below is the more simplified paint scheme which I got out of Trains Magazine. There's Warbash locomotives hauling Union Pacific equipment, which of course is the city of St. Louis. And then you've got the city of Kansas City departing further below. We're mentioning Union Pacific simply because of the connection. Union Pacific did not come to St. Louis in its own right. And I do not believe that their uh, locomotives ever came onto St. Louis. So another crop circle. And it's uh, nearly 300 miles from Kansas City to St. Louis. And uh, the Wabash participated in that part of the business. And they also contributed cars for equalization purposes to the Union Pacific trains. So you're going to see Wabash letterboards on Army Yellow cars. I will use a few examples of passenger train concerts from Wayner books. And uh, here is a typical one in 1959 with three E units, three head end cars, several coaches, one of them a dome and a dome buffet lounge. They were all introduced, the domes were introduced about 1957. Some of those sleepers would have come from St. Louis and one or two of them would have been added at Kansas City. Union Pacific had some PAs, but they were mostly at EMD E unit operation. Consists of the city of St. Louis changed over time. Uh, and also we need to point out that passenger cars operate in a very distinct order. And so you've got vestibule rear and vestibule forward to show which way round the car is in that particular train. And by 1968, the train wasn't even coming to St. Louis. By now it's called the city of Kansas City. But that showing in one decade, a drastic drop in the business between, uh, or just for that one train. Let's have a look at the Burlington. At one time they had more business than they did by the time the streamliner trains came along. And primarily they ran just the one train uh, going up to Minneapolis. Here's the schedule here. The Zephyr rocket was a joint operation with the Rock Island and uh, it ran partway up on the uh, Burlington, connecting to the Rock Island at Burlington and continuing on to Minneapolis. Each railroad provided one train set. Western railroads quite often provided connections at terminals information in their timetables. Eastern railroads like the New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad and the BNO, I've never found that kind of information. So here's a chance to see the overview of trains at St. Louis. And for Burlington, very little of these other railroads were competitors, so they were quite happy to show most of them uh, in their timetable. And at this time, there are about 110 arrivals and departures per day. And that is about half what we were talking about uh, when the a uh, situation was shown for the teens or 1920s. A few examples of CB and Q trains, including one of the shovel nose trains running as the Mark Twain Zephyr. This one I found in Trains Magazine via Flickr. The Frisco. It was a northern and eastern uh, terminal for the Frisco. They ran two trains a day to Omaha, Oklahoma City. They also went to Memphis and they also went to Dallas with the MKT. Here's an example from 1959. The St. Louis, Oklahoma train was called the Meteor. And by this time, it was also the Texas special for the Katy. And a little place called Veneta is where the uh, Katy equipment went off towards Dallas 
and also connected up with uh, another train that came from Kansas City. Rather nice paint scheme. Both Frisco and Katie used the same paint scheme for their streamlined passenger trains. And I found a blotter online, which was rather nice for an ad. Showed the Meteor, the Texas Special, etc., etc. Finding timetables for the Katie was rather a mission, but Streamliner Memories was an excellent source for timetables. I uh, had this one for 1938, which is a bit outside our time framing, but at least it shows a map of where the railroad went. The Air St. Louis tr uh, track was rather meandering towards the rest of the main line, which was the incentive to have the Texas Special because the Frisco had a more direct route from St. Louis towards Texas. And here is the Texas Special at that time. And the interesting thing about the way the Katy worked is they split trains around Denison, Texas, so that one train would go to Dallas and another one would go to Fort Worth and then continue on to either San Antonio or um, Houston. Examples of Katy trains. Even in the streamlined era, there were a large number of heavyweight cars at the head ends of the passenger trains. And to the left is the discontinuation by Katie of the other trains from St. Louis, just favoring the Texas Special. The Texas Special was the fastest service between Dallas and New York financial centers. Dallas being a financial center in the oil business and New York a financial center for much of the other stuff, except what's in Chicago. The GMO is uh, a favored line towards Chicago and had the most trains per day. Again, you have uh, a night train, a day train, and on this occasion, you've got a 10-6 that connected from the Abraham Lincoln to Hot Springs um, onto the Mopac train. And then going back again on the right-hand side. So some of those will get highlighted as we're going through various trains. They were the most frequent service to Chicago. They used both E units and PAs. And here's another colorized picture from Mr. Foss. Interesting colored equipment. Missouri Pacific, another hometown railroad, route of the Eagles. They had two trains specifically to Kansas City, and then one train each to Denver and Omaha via Kansas City, and three trains a day to Dallas. So they were the second biggest operator in and out of St. Louis. Using the 1960 timetable, we can show these connections. Now they have some competitors, so they don't show those, but by this time, just nine years after the Burlington example, we're down to 58 arrivals and departures per day. So the passenger business is diminishing rather quickly. Four trains a day between St. Louis and Kansas City and their main westbound train, the Colorado Eagle, had sleeping cars and thrifty sleepers, which was their version of a slumber coach. Trains down to Texas. Notice they optimistically want you to connect at El Paso onto the Southern Pacific. Uh, but if you look at some of those connections, you're waiting around for quite a long time. Chicago to Hot Springs car on the GMO, so that's the opposite end of what we saw before. And on the Texas Eagle, we've got one, two, three cars which came from north on the GMO and the east on the Pennsylvania and the B&O. The publicity photo shows a blue and white paint scheme. Uh, later on, they simplified it to just blue, as in the example below. See, there's at least a couple of dome cars on that train. 
And the Missouri River e Eagle, 1971, is a three-car train leaving Kansas City. And the Colorado Eagle is backing into St. Louis Union Station. That's an early picture because of the color scheme. More examples of consists. Colorado Eagle with three, uh, two E units, a 14 room at uh, sleeping car, and two other sleeping cars, a diner, a dome coach. But the Missouri River Eagle is interesting in that look at all of the head end cars that are on it, including one from New York Central, another one from the Pennsylvania, and several row express agency cars. 1963, simplified paint scheme, just about to depart, and a GM&O train off in the distance. The Rock Island. Rock Island had its own line from Kansas City, but by the time of the streamlined trains, it was freight only. But they did participate with the Burlington going up to Minneapolis, and uh, again, connection there was uh, at Burlington. Here's the timetable showing in the Rock Island timetable. And at Burlington, you can clearly see that the latter part of the run is on the queue. Nearly 600 mile run. The lower picture is a black and white shot with an E6 locomotive uh, of the Zephyr rocket. Rather fuzzy picture, but anyway, probably silver cars. Illinois Central had three trains a day going to Chicago. And they also had people that would connect to their uh, trains down to New Orleans. Um, I forget exactly where, probably Springfield. Here's an E-unit leaving from St. Louis Union Station. The LNN, again, an outpost of uh, operations for them. There were two periods when the Georgian ran to Atlanta from St. Louis in 1948, and then the last few years before Amtrak started. But most of the time they ran three daily trains to Evansville connecting with the name trains. Example there, they call it the Hummingbird and the Georgian, but it's connecting to two different trains. By this time in 1965, just one train a day. New York Central, again, a beeline straight from Indianapolis to St. Louis so that they get into that freight connection with the uh, Western railroads uh, by avoiding Chicago. At one point, they had five trains a day. Southwestern Limited was the premier train. Uh, New York Central did not provide any through service with other railroads. They provided red cap service that was specified in their timetables uh, so that you could get from the NYC train to the Frisco and Mopac connecting trains. And even with their connection that they did with the uh, California Zephyr, they provided their own car rather than being like the Pennsylvania did, providing a CZ looking car. Southwestern Limited, pinstripe colors in the 1950 and then the cigar band by about 1965. Pennsylvania, again coming from Indianapolis, probably had frequent races with the New York Central, which they often did particularly out of Elkhart. Another five trains a day. The Spirit of St. Louis came New York to St. Louis with connecting cars or through cars from Washington. By 1954, section cars were becoming somewhat obsolete, but they did have a number of betterment cars that they were put into this train. One of the reasons for continuing to have sections was that when the government paid for their people to travel by train, they paid for a lower berth. So if you had sections, that's what you would accommodate the passenger with. If you did not have any sections, you had to provide them a roomette, which was uh, higher priced accommodations for a lower fare. The Penn Texas, another train, is the one that had all the connecting cars, 
but we're going further west on the Mopac and the Frisco. BP-20s, interesting locomotive, which was only ever operated by the Pennsylvania that did come to St. Louis on the spirit of St. Louis. <clears throat> Penn, Texas coming in. And you can tell it's deriving because it's going to come past the depot and then back in. The caption for the top one, because a lot of these captions are exactly from where I stole the picture from. This originally said it was departing, but at this position, it is actually going backing into the depot and a Missouri Pacific train is coming out. Here's a Frisco car in a Penzi consist. Um, there would be a Pennsylvania one with the, their own letterboard uh, every third or fourth day. Southern Railway had no passenger business by this time into St. Louis. Baltimore and Ohio, a beeline from Cincinnati. The National Limited was the class train followed by the diplomat coming from uh, New York and Baltimore and Washington. Rather nice paint scheme. Um, they rebuilt a number of heavyweight cars to look stream style. And this baggage dormitory is an example of that. And in 1932, the National Limited was the first long distance train to be fully air conditioned. Sometimes the early air conditioning efforts were sleepers, followed by coaches, followed by diners. Nickel plate came in once a day from Cleveland. And uh, they operated, the only sleeping car they had was a 10-6, and they had 13 of them for the various trains that they ran. The cotton belt. While I found this on the web for the cover and the map, um, I couldn't get any further from this particular resource as to content. So I happen to have a 1951 official guide of the railways. It's rather fragile, but uh, I scanned this the other day and um, there was one train in 1951, each way from there to Dallas. And all of that train at that time was still heavyweight. Uh, Cotton Belt did have pretty trains in daylight colours, but probably not on this particular run. I missed one. In 1968, Penn Central was formed, and here is a timetable from that operation. Three trains a day came to St. Louis. They were all former Pennsylvania trains, so the New York one, New York Central one, had been eliminated. Notice there are no through cars to anywhere. In 1971, Amtrak came into uh, existence and initially that ran uh, the schedules you'll see in a moment. Today, Amtrak has five trains a day from Chicago, one from San Antonio and two trains from Kansas City. So it's considerable growth from what they started with, which was one train that went from New York via St. Louis to Kansas City, and then two trains from Chicago. And that was it. We're going to go through a few pictures just to show you how pretty the trains were that came to St. Louis. Um, nickel plate with their PAs, that was their only passenger power. New York Central with PAs and E's. Pennsylvania with their nice Tuscan red, their BP-20s in the green or black PAs as well. Wabash had PAs and E's. I think I missed one. Nope, there we go. Wabash E unit. I think that is in, uh, looks like the St. Louis area. Uh, B and O with their blue, that's a fairly late color scheme. New York Central Cigar Band on the Knickerbocker, which was one of the trains out of New York. And uh, GM&O, just before Amtrak started. Panama Limited, well, they'd be a connecting train by then. 
It's got a Jeep instead of uh, E units. And um, this Missouri Pacific train has a whole two cars. The Frisco was the only railroad to operate locomotives which had the name of the train on, emblazoned on the locomotives, Texas Special. This is, whoop. Go to the passenger cars. Here's an example of a slumber coach. The idea behind the slumber coach was to provide a sleeping room on a coach ticket. And by the design of this particular car, you were able to get 40 people into it versus a 10-6, which had 22. And 40 people in uh, sleeping accommodations is not much less than a long distance coach, which usually had 44 to 48 passengers. Illinois Central, on the other hand, uh, you see dome cars in Illinois Central colors, yet they never owned any. They rented cars from other railroads in the winter season and uh, painted them Illinois Central, then gave them back. And I know from the Northern Pacific examples, they would usually get one that's needing repainting anyway and get it back and uh, repaint it in the proper colors. Texas Special, round end observation. Allen N, blue cars, Union Pacific, yellow cars, and that uh, Wabash blue on stainless steel. Pennsylvania Tuscan, attractive GM and O colors, is um, an Eagle car, which uh, it has the owner at each end, so it would say MP for the majority of the cars from Missouri Pacific. New York Central two tone gray. And we have reached the end, and I'm a bit early. You mind going back one slide? One slide. Yes. One slide. I noticed there's some blue and and red in the same train. And even the one at the top right, those two cars might not be the same color either. I don't think they are. Um, and, I can't answer the but, question. So did they it could very well be. Sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. It could very well be that it was after Amtrak came along, and they're either in storage or excursion service. So uh, um, okay. there's no mention of dates on those particular pictures. How did we do? Good. You have at least a hundred people awake. Uh, oh. Have you done any research on the mail and baggage portions of the passenger trains? No, there there would have been huge amounts of mail coming in and out of St. Louis. So I would think there'd be a large terminal annex, annex there for mail. And I'm sure Row Express Agency had a large operation there too for train shipments. And as you saw with the Missouri Pacific train through cars. Yes. Do you have any idea what it cost to ride the train back then? 1960, 1962. I don't have the answer, but if you look at those uh, streamliner memories timetables that I stole, uh, generally at the back end of those, uh, they quite often have sample fares, okay. both coach and sleeper. And then we know that Amtrak took it over at yes. some point. Would it be? Well, what, May 1st, 1971. Correct. What would the... Uh, profitability being between now and way back then? Did it well, cost more to run passenger trains or? I don't know. I, I don't think passenger trains ever were a profit maker from the point of view of uh, oh, we're going to make big bucks out of it. It's more of a service. And uh, when that service was no longer required, they quickly eliminated it. So. Why would you uh, take a train all the way from New York to Dallas if you uh, can fly there in four hours? Correct. Do you know how many trains went east and how many went west? How many trains east and then to the west? Uh, a small number went west. So really, you only had the Colorado Eagle for the Missouri Pacific, which went to Denver via Pueblo. And you had the Union Pacific train, which... It had connections, but well, you could take a through car all the way to Portland or Seattle sometimes mm -hmm. on the Union Pacific. 
And do you have any idea of how many passengers went through St. Louis each day? A lot. I would think in World War II that place would have been gangbusters. And the fact that every train terminates there, um, everybody has to get off and everybody has to get on, whereas if you compare that with Kansas City, all those trains on the Santa Fe and the Rock Island, a fair proportion of the passengers were on it when it arrived and still on it when it left. So there'd be a lot more, lot less servicing of passengers at Kansas City. And a lot more foot traffic in St. Louis. Yes. So someone someone noticed that you had a, um, a timetable there going south from Chicago. Do you know if Bloomington Normal, Illinois was a stop south of that? I don't, I don't know. It sounds like it would have been Illinois Central. Another thing to remember, which I haven't uh, featured here at all, is the large interurban network an Illinois terminal was one of them, um, which pervade you know, for Illinois and Indiana. And so uh, a lot of people wouldn't use the railroad, they would use the interurban. And right. uh, you don't Did see you suburban or local trains out of either Kansas City or um, St. Louis in the uh, streamlined era. Pam mentioned that uh, about 100,000 people a day during World War II. That's pretty good. Um, Tom wants to know if the California Zephyr went all the way to, or did it go into St. Louis? No, it was a Chicago, Omaha, Denver train. Okay. And that is the end of the questions. There's still a few more coming in. I, I see people typing. Well, we've got so, some time. Yeah. Come on, guys, bring on those questions. <laughs> Type faster. Nice, nice. Were well, people enough people interested? Yeah. I did see someone comment that uh, there were very few St. Louis topics in this particular uh, sequence. So. We cannot say that we didn't try. Well, certainly Brad, we Joseph, Brad Joseph tried to get us all involved. So I don't know how many from the convention actually participate. Why did you say the two Allen N trains were again? Hummingbird and the Georgian. Georgian. Georgian, yeah. Going to Atlanta. I believe he is correct. The IC was a route south from Bloomington Normal. This guy knows his railroads. <laughs> I could have well, told you that. <laughs> the um, Illinois Central basically went straight south from Chicago to New Orleans. So. And is, is the Zephyr still doesn't go through St. Louis. No. But back in the heavyweight days, uh, the Scenic Limited, that was a Mopac connection. So um, that really wasn't uh, sort of promoted very much in the uh, California Zephyr days. So, so if you were to go from St. Louis to Kansas City, what, yes. which train would you take or how many trains would you have a day that you could choose from? There were three Wabash and four Mopac. And when you consider the Rock Island also took that route but didn't run passenger trains, the Burlington took that route and also didn't take passenger trains. And really, those two railroads dominated that business. Oh, wow. There's another so there's question. a question just come in then, Speed. Uh, yeah. Dave has asked, what year did the station last was last used as train service? He believes it's now used as a mall. Uh, it was fairly shortly after Amtrak started. So I would think around the early to mid 70s. And I remember using the station that they did put together and it was basically a series of containers, um, mm -hmm. rather rudimentary operation there. It's a lot better now at Gateway Station, I believe. Don't have a chance to do that, do we, this year? And you said there's right. still a hotel in there? Yes. Okay. I could look it up and tell you the brand if you like. Please. 
Okay. We might get some more questions. <laughs> yeah, Pam's just put in the chat there, the final passenger train departed on October 31, 1978, at 11.38 p.m. Brad, were maybe you she needs, Maybe she needs to do a clinic. <laughs> Speed, all still a twinkle. We, uh, Paul, we're working on her. <laughs> we're begging. What sort of topics does she like to do? Pam, tell us. He is magic behind the scenes here with the computer. You just you just well, mention a website and she has it already typed in, verified <laughs> and double check. Uh, the St. Louis Union Station Hotel Curiosity Shop, Drury Inn in St. Louis at Union Station. So it's a Drury Inn. Okay. But it doesn't seem to be in the same location as the original station, which was in the head house. Like the terminal station was a terminal hotel was in that head house. And that mall is called St. Louis Union Station Carousel. So did you perhaps by any chance uh, rode a train into St. Louis? Me? Yes. I rode a train out, but not in. Okay. I went there one time with, oh, well, at the last St. Louis convention in uh, 2001, uh, some friends from Portland, Oregon area and I uh, shared a train up to Chicago and I was taking the Builder and they were taking the Zephyr out of Chicago and um, we had several hours. So uh, they knew to take us on a, a river cruise. The architectural river cruise in Chicago is a must do. I can imagine. Run out of questions? Da, 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 da. Or have we got the title of Pam's Clinic? Pam's just put in there, it's a, it's a secret, so. It's a, it's a railroad secret. <laughs> I remember a magazine editor trying to come up with a, a clinic that had zero contact. I figured he uh, got close a couple of times. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you which editor. The Drury is across the street in what was the railroad YMCA. Oh, okay. Is this your uh, expert again? No, 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 no. Uh, the expert said it's a collection by Hilton property. Okay. Well, Paul, that was, that was excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was really, really nice. I learned a lot. Was and that the idea? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's also the reason why we, we lack so many questions. We've had so many good clinics with so much information packed into them that yeah. no one has any questions left. They've you've, had a good, you've had a good selection today, and I always like Dave Berman's talks. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess that's, um, that's going to close us out for day three and lead us into day four, but... Um, I'll throw a quick slide up um, once we're finished here of, of all the events for tomorrow that everyone can check out. And there'll be definitely some new stuff on there and stuff to look forward to. So you got anything else to add there, Speed? Goodbye, everybody. And thank you for staying with us. And thank you, Paul, for awesome clinic. Very welcome. Thank you. Have fun. Look forward to tomorrow. I can just watch.